Hey everybody, I hope that this is working correctly. This is my first time actually setting one of these up on my own. Uh, so I'm hoping that people can hear me and the world hasn't ended or anything like that. To give you a quick update, uh, Andrew ran into some technical difficulties when setting up uh, the live stream. His internet was falling through and freaking out for whatever reason. And uh, so I'm just going to be here to give like a very, very quick little update on what we're doing, uh, some questions about the show in general, and then just something that I was thinking about with regards to good goal setting and um, realistic expectations of progression. Um, give me one sec. I'm just trying to share this, but I'm not actually sure if the audio is working. So if someone could tell me if the audio is working, that would be great. Can you guys hear me? Are we doing the thing? It's very strange to do this without any additional commentary from Andrew, to be honest. I feel like I'm just kind of shouting into the abyss. Hey, I barely hear you. Okay, we got something. So I'll turn up my gain real quick. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Let me know if that's an improvement. Um, and we're, I'm probably now like bouncing all off the walls or something, and it's obscenely loud. A little bit better. We got a little something. The testing phase of these videos is always fun. I wish we could just like cut this part off, but I'm not sure if I'm tech savvy enough to be able to do that. So hopefully that improved the audio situation. So yeah, just Andrew ran into a little internet issue. It wasn't a big deal, um, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes with these sorts of things. But what we wanted to talk about for a second was sort of two different categories of things. The first category was our sort of goals and thoughts for the show moving forward, including the um, time that the show will run on. Specifically, we were thinking about moving to a later show, like a 6 p.m. PST. There's a pull up on the page. If you haven't taken it yet, it would be great if you could, because uh, it will really help kind of guide us in terms of when we're going to be doing the thing from here on out. And then second, um, I wanted to uh, do a quick little video or something like that on realistic goal setting. Um, I was at Dance and Play this past weekend and there was a great uh, Q&A from a variety of the people on staff, Khalees Key, Michael Kielbasa, Glenn Ball, and uh, Jim Minty, who was the chief judge over the weekend. So how's my volume doing? Am I, am I surviving? You can chime on in with that. And uh, one of the things that was really brought up is this idea of how do I get better at this dance in a context where there's not really a lot of clear guidance on what's right and what's wrong at any given moment in time. And additionally, this thing that happens sometimes where we look at professional dancers or professional instructors, hey, audio is much better, good to go. Um, we look at professional dancers or instructors and we say, wow, they're amazing. Like, there's no way that I could ever be that good. And you're right. They are amazing, but there are ways you can be that good. Um, so I got Victoria's permission to share this. And uh, this is an absolutely incredible video. Uh, it is legendary. I would share it on the screen, but A, I don't know how to do that. And B, if I did it, we would get a copyright takedown complaint from Facebook. So I'm going to avoid it. Um, I strongly recommend you watch it. It's from 2012. It's Kevin Kane and Victoria Hank at Palm Springs. I think Palm Springs summer, but they're the same event. So whichever Palm Springs it is, it's one of the Palm Springs events. And um, it's just them kind of randomly social dancing. And they're good dancers, but they had like just started dancing a couple of years ago. Um, and they both look decidedly mortal in this dance. They look like two people having a perfectly nice sort of intermediate social dance. And my point is that this was just six years ago. And now uh, Victoria is out there winning the US Open and Kevin is like a top, top all-star dancer um, amid having a lot of other awesome stuff going on in his life. He's competed in the classic, he's done a whole bunch of things. And I think that it's good sometimes to just check in on that framework of reasonable timelines and progression and improvement over time realistically. Because it's easy to look at the finished products and go, I can never do that. 
But if you check in on like points along the way, all of a sudden growth seems like a much more realistic target. Um, so anyway, so how do you do it? Well, the first thing that you do is you have sort of a realistic sense of what you're trying to achieve inside of a dance. Uh, Victoria pretty quickly moved to a point where she was like, this is sort of what I want to do right now. And that, of course, accelerated her growth pattern. Kevin took the dance really, really seriously. That accelerated his growth pattern. But both of them approached it with a fundamental perspective of, I want to grow and learn and improve my dancing. And in six years, here they are. Six years might sound like a long time, but honestly, in terms of the pursuit of a hobby in like a serious and thoughtful way, it's really a pretty short period of time, particularly if you were like 12 at the time or whatever Victoria was, 13 at the time, puberty is a hell of a drug. And also just uh, that mentality is so different. Your brain is much more receptive at that point in time to new information than it is when you're 30 or 40 or 50 years old. Your body's different. You have fewer bad habits. All of these things matter. I'm not trying to like neglect all of them and say that we can all be a world champion in six years. But I'm saying that when you approach it with the mentality of incremental growth, all of a sudden, a lot of cool things start to become possible. So here, so I, um, sorry for the, uh, the keyboard noise. Uh, I'm trying to find a video. I should have saved it. But uh, this is from City of Angels is the one that I'm looking for. Sorry, I'm sure that this is just, okay, here we go. I'm sure this is just like scintillating content watching me type. Okay, here's another one. So here's a video. Yeah, the time's going to pass anyways. You might as well fill it with some practice, right? You might as well actually pursue your goal in like a deliberate and thoughtful way. So here's a video uh, that I just shared in the chat, if you can't see it, from 2014 at City of Angels. So this is now four years ago. Um, and again, it's another video of Victoria dancing. I'm not sure why she's the guinea pig for this. I think that the reason that I thought it made sense to pick her was actually I was thinking back to a dance that I had with her in advanced. And also she's somebody who's like ascended fairly recently and ascended extremely rapidly to being on like the absolute top of the heap. And this is like a perfectly good advanced all-star dance. Like it's a it's a really great advanced all-star dance. You could see the magic beginning to happen. But I think that if you look at this, a lot of people who are in advanced or intermediate right now watch this video, could watch this video and they could look at what Eric's doing where Eric is now, again, like a top teacher in the Bay Area and uh, Victoria, as I said before, is a world champion, can look at this video and go, yeah, I can do that. Like that's reasonable, that's realistic, that's not out of grasp. And that progression happened in just a couple of years. You know, like it wasn't something that came from nothing, it came from somewhere, it came from work, it came from effort. So that's just sort of what I wanted to highlight here with the idea is that if you don't get too trapped by the final product and by this idea of perfection or nothing, then you can really find strong incremental improvement along the way. And you can really do that if you want to for almost any professional. Like honestly, like look up videos of Kyle dancing in like the 90s. You know, he dances like a different dude that he was basically a kid. Um, look up uh, old, like ancient videos of Jordan and Todd competing in like juniors, all right? It's like, it was a very different animal back then. And I think that that sort of frames progression in a much more naturalistic way. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of most of what my initial uh, thought was in terms of doing this. And then particularly, as long as we're here <laughs> and people appear to be listening for whatever reason, um, the sort of final piece of it that I wanted to mention during this kind of short video is one of, of the questions that I like to ask during um, Q&As. So when I am in a Q&A and I'm in a Q&A with great, great, great dancers, as I was at Dance and Play, as I said, one of the questions that I like to ask that I didn't actually get around to then is what are you working on right now? And I would encourage people to ask it of their instructors, not because it's like a test, not because it's like, oh, we should all, you know, trying to expose weakness or something like that. It's, it's not at all about that. Oh, it's my hair. Yes, the, the hair apparently is on point today. I'm going to mess it up a little bit so it becomes less distracting. Great. Um, <laughs> sorry, Alan, you totally sidelined my train of thought there. Anyways, yeah, so asking people what they're working on. But the, the power of that is the realization that everyone's working on something. 
and that you have these people who have trained this dance in a serious way for 20 years and they're still working on something. And a lot of the time when you, when you ask them that question, they'll say things like, oh my God, I'm working on everything. And they're kind of so excited to kind of talk about their own process. Um, I really find that with a lot of people. I, uh, Glenn had that moment in the Q&A where he was like, yeah, to be honest, I've only really been doing this dance in a serious way for two, three, four years, something like that. And I really feel like I'm learning something new every day. And for a long time, I was a trained dancer. He came with an incredible world-class hip hop background. Um, but like, I didn't really know how to do West Coast Swing and I felt sort of lost and I was kind of finding my way. And man, if somebody who is, you know, competing at the highest, highest level, just got whatever it was, third in showcase at the US Open last year, I think second the year before that, something like that. Um, if they're competing at like the highest, highest, highest level and they're still working on all these things, then like, what am I doing? You know, what's my responsibility as a learner? Um, to engage in that process. And the idea that pro progression can be had at sort of any point in the process. So that's just sort of a short thought that I had and I wanted to get something up there as a quick video this week um, because Andrew wasn't available. If anyone who happens to be in the chat has like a, anything that they wanna throw in there, we can totally do that. Or is any questions about the show, anything they're thinking about, we can take, I don't know, five minutes or something and do that sort of a thing. Um, but outside of that, that's kind of what I just wanted to say real quick. So I'm just going to linger for a second and see if anyone happens to have any commentary. Hmm. I think we're good to go here. Yeah, I mean, uh, one other quick thing. I think that we're currently considering moving the show to Tuesday versus Wednesday. If you have any strong feelings on that, uh, give us a thought. And, um, oh man, oh God, now the, now all the comments are rolling in. Jeez, the strongest of strong delays. All right, sure, okay, we can do this for a minute. Uh, so yeah, just to finish that thought, um, Tuesday or Wednesday, we're thinking about uh, moving it to one or the other. If you have a strong preference, let me know. And uh, we have a question from Mahela. Say it with me, Mahela. Uh, what am I working on? Oh man. Okay, so this is... Sure, why not? We'll do the thing. Uh, so what am I working on right now is I'm working on, unfortunately, many, many things. I would say that my primary focus right now is on getting more movement into my own body. Um, if you watch any videos of me dancing, and I don't really recommend it, but if you happen to, um, my sort of weakness as a dancer right now is expressing my own body through movement. Uh, something happened in there. My background is in partner dancing. It was in ballroom for I don't know, six, eight years really, really seriously and maybe 10 years in total. Um, and so I've always been somebody who's been more focused on kind of dancing my follower than I've been on expressing my own body as an individual dancer. And that was fine for a while, but I'm getting to the current point where if I want to continue to advance, if I want to make like a serious push um, to be at least somebody that the top people are enjoy dancing with or want to joy want to draw on the prelim of Jack and Jill, you know, whatever it might be, or at least are comfortable with drawing in the prelim of a Jack and Jill, then that's kind of the next thing that I really need to grow is my own individual expression. Um, and also uh, there was something that Benji said in a workshop recently that kind of stuck with me. And it was basically that triple, but make sure your triples are doing something. So don't just triple because we're told to go walk, walk, triple triple because there is a purpose and an intention behind that movement. So you can do just a basic like one, two, three in place, or you can not, and you can do a variation of some kind that gets you into locomotion and sort of moves you around the slot in a more effective way, communicating something to your partner, keeping that engine running, even when you're doing a sort of quote unquote stationary movement. So those are the things that I'm really working on in my dancing. And hopefully if you've watched a video of me over the last six months or last year, as opposed to uh, the previous years before that, that's come through at least a little bit. Um, that would sort of be my hope. But uh, okay, so Victor mentioned something about Hugo. Yeah, so Hugo um, has really grown in the last couple of years because he's had a real learning focus. And I think that you see that in the people who have really shot up recently. Um, some of the people that come, I mean, there are many people, so just because I don't name something doesn't mean I'm not saying them. But over the last couple of years, like Hugo has really kind of exploded in this dancing. Um, and he's really, really gone up a level in terms of my estimation. Uh, Victoria has really sailed through as kind of our primary example. Um, Alyssa Glanville is an example of somebody who has, again, over the last couple of years, I think like really, really leveled up. 
And what all of those three people have in common is they take a lot of solo classes. Like they take a lot of workshops, guys. These people don't stop working just because they get to the champions division. Um, it's a continuous process of growth and effort. And if they can grow so much while already dancing in the top competitive division, man, like so can we, right? So I think that that's really something to, to take away is cross-training and the idea of continuing to improve your own movement through other dances. Because to be honest, I think that's something that we're not quite as good at teaching in this dance is individual movement and hip hop, contemporary jazz. These dancers really understand how to teach individual movement. In West Coast, we're really good at teaching partner movement, but we're really not so great at teaching like how to move your own body in an effective way within the confines of this dance. Um, so I think that honestly, like if you feel uncomfortable, just moving your body on your own in front of a mirror, the way to improve that is by moving your body on your own in front of a mirror. Like it's sort of an unfortunate truth, right? The way to grow the things that we struggle with is by struggling through them. Uh, for a really, really long time, I was profoundly uncomfortable just standing in front of a mirror, looking at my stupid self and wiggling around. Um, and so I just did it a lot until the discomfort started to kind of fade away a little bit. Yeah, apparently the um, Victor is mentioning that Benji had a similar comment in a workshop that he was teaching at Arama, which like the big problem in our dance right now being the triple steps. And that's a comment that like could get you into some hot water because of the whole ongoing argument about whether or not our dancing is straying too far away from um, some of the kind of underlying truths, you know, dancing to blues music, dancing a swing rhythm, dancing your triples, whatever it might be, the constant complaint of how in All Star, man, like no one actually dances with each other. We're all just out there rolling around on the floor. Like that's so well and good. Triples are great. Like, don't get me wrong. I probably triple too much. That's probably actually a weakness in my dancing is that I triple too much, which is a weird thing to say, but it's because of what sort of Benji is pointing to there, right? Like my triples aren't doing anything. I'm doing them because I think that the right way to do this dance is to go walk, walk, triple, triple. So at a certain point, the dance is actually getting in the way of the dancing. And that's really a kind of important concept to communicate is that at the end of all of this, at the end of everything we're doing inside of this partner dance, the point is to dance. It's not just to like execute a series of patterns because we think that that's the series of patterns that's going to win. It's not to lead a sugar push properly in order to sugar push somebody properly. The point is to dance. Um, I talked to somebody at Rose City uh, that I was judging, I think like the novice division or something like that. I believe he was a novice dancer. And he came up to me and he asked me, hey, like I felt like I danced really well in my prelim. And I got zero recalls to the final. And I danced on time, and I danced walk, walk, triple, triple, and I did like a sugar push, and I did a left side pass, and it was great. And so I am just feel very defeated right now because in that movement, I've been told over and over again that what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to dance on time, and I'm supposed to dance rhythmically, and I'm supposed to dance strong basics. And I do that, and I don't make the final. And I say to him, yes, but I remember watching you dance, so I can tell you exactly what I saw, and it's that you were doing a lot of steps, but you weren't actually dancing. Your body was not moving. You are not expressing your own individual movement through this dance. You might as well have been standing in place and moving your arms back and forth and going, okay, here's my dance and now I'm dancing. No, at a certain point, you have to live in your body. So at a certain point, you have to actually express your movement. And that was kind of the problem with what this individual leader was doing, that yes, he was dancing the movements of the dance, but he wasn't really actually dancing. And that's kind of a, that's a very fine distinction. Like it's a little bit hair splitty, but for me, it's kind of the critical core of what we're doing here. That if you are not expressing your body through movement to music, you're not dancing, right? Yeah, so the double and triple rhythms are part of that as Eric is saying, the point is to dance, but it has these defining characteristics. We don't need to triple all the time. What do you think is the, oh, of the rhythm and dancing of this dance? Okay, great. Um, yeah, we should dance, but in future, fortunately. Okay, so Victor and Eric are pointing to something that apparently in this little short for Fuzzy's video, we're, we're getting into a thing here. Um, yeah, so this is obviously a swing dance. It's movement that's expressed in this particular kind of way within the boundaries of swing. And the underlying rhythms are essential to that. Um, 
what I'm really saying here is that in this particular example with this particular dancer, what was happened was they were just going through the movements with their body. I would not say that they were particularly expressing a, a swung rhythm or a triple rhythm or something where the music was living in their body in some felt way. I am more than happy to watch somebody dance sugar pushes all day long. Like, I'm fine with it. I'm not somebody who's like, you have to dance these really elaborate figures in order to express this dancing properly. That is not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that um, I need to see the music impact your body in some way that isn't just about expressing linear movement through a remembered pattern. You know, because otherwise you're basically just a tape recorder. You're just saying, okay, my teacher told me to step back on one and then step back on two and put my feet in these spots and then we're done. At a certain point, the body has to express. And what it should be expressing is a swung rhythm and the importance of triple timing and all of those beautiful swing dancing characteristics, right? But the idea that just going like walk, walk, triple, triple means that you're doing West Coast swing is, is just not really accurate. Um, so the, the the point is that there's this whole idea of like, can you triple with your body? I'm, I don't know. I have sort of mixed feelings about that sentiment. Um, but for me, the important message carried inside of the like triple with your body communication is that it's about expressing the music through movement. Okay, so if we're dancing to a music that has more of a swung rhythm, as Victor is pointing to right now, you should be expressing that swung rhythm through your body. If you're dancing to music that doesn't have a swung rhythm, should you be expressing swung rhythm through your body? I don't know. Um, honestly, I feel like that's kind of a question that's above my pay grade, so I'm not going to pretend to be able to answer it effectively. But I think that it's it's an interesting point that we're kind of pushing to here. Like if you if we're playing music all the time that has kind of a um, that's slightly controversial to what you're talking about, like mapping idea about last year. I'm not sure how it's um, how it's contrary to that. I think you meant to say contrary, Stephen. But if you meant um, if you meant the word that you chose, let me know. But I think that you meant how is that contrary to what you guys talked about last week with mapping out the dance. Um, so for me, Robert is a great example of somebody who both maps his dance and beautifully expresses the, the music through movement. Like Robert's actually kind of the perfect example of somebody who totally crushes this idea because he has an idea in his brain, right? He's like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. But Robert is such a master of this process and has been doing it for, for a minute. So, you know, he's got some reps where the music comes on and then the map loads. You know, it's not the other way around. He doesn't go into it with like, all right, here's what I'm gonna do in my first phrase and here's what I'm gonna do in my second and here's what I'm gonna do in my third. Um, if you have a second, watch the video of, at uh, it was Capital this year of Robert dancing with Lorraine that drew each other in the Jack and Jill it was great. Um, and it is the ultimate like kick line dance. They're dancing the old school music. He hits all the Robert and Lorraine greatest hits. It was awesome. And it felt really fulfilling because the audience was so invested in them and so wanted them to, to move through the whole catalog. So like, yeah, was he kind of moving through the catalog? Sure he was, but he was doing that because that's what we wanted. He was expressing it artistically. He was swinging his rhythms. He was dancing to the music. So he was checking all of these boxes simultaneously, which for me is really the point, right? So that's sort of how I would kind of speak to that. Um, so there's a comment from Eric. Okay, apparently I acquitted myself well with Eric, which I appreciate, Eric. Thanks as always for giving it a listen. I really appreciate it. Um, Victor made a mention of the music. Yeah, so it is true that, and this is something we talk about kind of ad nauseum in this, which is that as the music changes, it impacts the dance. And this is not a bad thing. So people get kind of up in arms about the movement of West Coast Swing away from swing music. I may or may not have tapped the mic there. Sorry about that. It's kind of a natural progression. Um, I think actually the greatest strength of this dance, as I've mentioned in the past, is that we dance it to contemporary music. Like that is our single massive identifying win over almost every other partner dance. And it is a huge asset for the growth of this dance. I came into this dance because I wanted to dance to music I liked. Kind of period. Like it, it was, that was like one B, one A was I met people and I really liked them. So I liked the community and I loved the music. 
And I also happen to enjoy the dancing. But that was really the order of operations. Like, isn't that kind of fascinating, right? That's what really got me into the dance. So I think that it would be completely foolish for us to remove like our single greatest marketing asset um, of dancing to contemporary music. Now, of course, we have to kind of preserve the soul of the dance and find ways to do that. Um, there are some efforts that are going on right now to codify the movements of West Coast Swing a little bit more. There are some uh, efforts ongoing over the last many years, again, Robert, somebody who's sort of spearheading this to really teach the history of the dance, Benji as well. Um, so I'm not really worried personally about us like losing the soul of West Coast Swing in this new weird music. I think that DJs should be more thoughtful about what they play though. Um, I've really tried to make, and look, I mess this up all the time. As Mike Anderson is is fond of uh, telling this story, I played a uh, sale in my first ever contest that I DJed. Um, so uh, I played it, I think it was in, like an advanced all skate or something. I have no idea why I did it. It was my first contest ever. It is what it is. Sorry guys, if you're competed in that. Um, but I've made like a real deliberate effort over the last maybe 18 months as I've kind of become more thoughtful about it to limit the um, the quantity of music that I play that has just a blatantly uh, not swing rhythm to it. Like if it's flat, okay, that's fine. But if like it's straight up samba, if it's straight up hustle, I've kind of started to move away from playing that style of music as much. And let's be honest with ourselves for our full admission, guys. It's just you and me here. It's just me and you know 30 of my closest friends, guys. I like dancing to Havana. I'm sorry. I like dancing to Havana. What can I say? It's a fun song to dance to. Okay. It is what it is. Here we are. Um, so that's, that's my confession to you in this uh, impromptu West Coast Live episode is that I do enjoy me a little bit of Dem Cuban beats in my West Coast swing. But do I think that that should be the predominance of what we dance to in um, like contests? No, I, I don't. I don't think it should be most of what we dance to in contests, but I'll dance to it socially. I think the strength of this dance is that we can dance to stuff like that socially. Hey, I'm, I'm getting a lot of Havana support. I like it in the chat. I like it. So yeah, I mean, so that's sort of what I would say is that the music that I think um, that's contemporary, uh, Victor sort of asked Joel in the chat, what contemporary music is sort of most appropriate for West Coast Swing? to uh, answer for Joel, and Lord knows he doesn't need somebody to answer for him, but just to kind of throw it out there, for me, I think it's R&B. Um, I think that most like R&B and hip hop is a great, um, sorry, I'm just messing with my video settings real quick because I'm turning strange colors for whatever reason. Uh, so I think that R&B, like contemporary hip hop and things like that is the current day version of blues. And that's a really, really weird thing to say until you actually think about it a little bit. Like it is the, linear train from sort of the ultimate uh, parent of blues that we currently have it that exists that is as at its most popular. So there are, of course, other derivatives, like there's still blues music being made, there's still um, shuffle music being played, there's still a ton of country music being played, of course. But in terms of like the contemporary mainstream, the style of music that's most popular that relates to swing from a danceable standpoint, from an actual swung rhythm, um, is R&B. And so I think that R&B fits the character of the dance really nicely. Uh, and you can find a lot of songs that have either more of an R&B swung rhythm, which is not the same as a blues rhythm most of the time, but hey, I'll take what I can get. And uh, then some things with straight timing and flat timing that tend to do pretty well. So that's sort of how I would answer the question personally. And I would sort of lean away from like the highly Afro-Cuban influence that like a lot of samba, a lot of zouk, a lot of hustle that kind of stuff. But that's, again, just sort of my personal opinion. Um, so Jody asked a question. I've been told as a novice that I should not be extending patterns any more than two beats, and that I should be sticking to basic patterns, passes, whips, stay away from musicality interpretation. OK, yeah, how do, how do you dance within a limitation? OK, so here's the distinction that I want to draw here. What I was saying with that comment, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to kind of amend this a little bit, because I really want to be clear about what I mean. It's not about go out there and roll on the floor if your heart tells you to roll on the floor. Like that is not what I'm saying here, guys, at all. There are rules and limitations that exist within the boundaries of West Coast Sweat. We have fewer of them than almost any other partner dance, but they do exist. What I am saying is that, I, 
I would stand up and actually demo this if I can, but I'm not sure, I don't think I can fit in frame very well, so don't worry about it. Um, what I'm saying is that if I stiffly take my partner and I go step, step, triple, step, triple, step, how, did I just dance West Coast Swing? Let's, let's assume that a swing song was on and I did that. Was I dancing West Coast Swing? Well, I was moving through the basic rhythm and I was moving a partner and I was on time, but was I dancing West Coast Swing? And for me, I would say no, because there was no rhythmic expression that came through my body. I was, I was just sort of repeating an action. So I think that in our pursuit of like being on time and dancing, you know, leading our partner and dancing our triples, sometimes we can lose the actual spirit of the dance. And that I think is sometimes difficult to communicate to people, particularly at like the novice level when they're coming up, where I wanna see your body move a little bit. You know, I wanna see you have a little something, just a little anything, like seriously anything, like a little body movement a little shoulder movement, a little something in the legs and feet where there's a looseness to the body and we're moving through a figure, whatever it might be. Like, I kind of need to see that to think of you as dancing. So th that's kind of the distinction that I'm, that I'm trying to draw here. And um, I, I hope that that was communicated in a uh, reasonable, reasonable way. So there you go. Um, so Patrick had a comment about mechanically triples facilitate bend. Yes, I agree with that. Um, they facilitate building and then expelling energy. That's an interesting thought. I think that's true. Something I see when people don't triple is that it can end up looking more stuck until you begin tripling with your body. That is to say, doing whatever the intent to. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here's sort of what I would say about that is that I do find. All right. So let's relate this to another fun point, which is what shoes should you dance on. I know, like, it's a one second video and I'm hitting like every topic that gets people up in arms. Great, go me. Um, I find that when I dance in like uh, plastic sold or rubber sold shoes, like uh, I dance in Converse fairly frequently when I social dance. I never do for a competition, but I do when I social dance. Or if you see people dance in toms or things like that. What I find with those stickier shoes is that typically what happens is that the dancer is more stationary on the floor. They do tend to triple less, they tend to do single rhythms more, and they tend to move less. For obvious reasons, they're extremely grounding. They literally stick you to the floor. So what happens over time is that you just end up moving less. Um, so yeah, there is a way where if you do a triple rhythm, you are putting the body into movement inherently. And therefore, that, um, that additional movement, you can use that energy to kind of get you from point A to point B, right? So the triple is like absolutely a super powerful tool for moving around in this dance. Um, it's just about what are you, it's not about like triple or don't triple. It's about why are you tripling? Like that, that's really what I want to kind of get to here. My point in all of this is it's not about do the thing or don't do the thing. It's about why are you doing the thing? Or why are you not doing the thing? What is your explanation for the choice that you are making at a given moment in the dance? And that's a very challenging concept to apply to somebody who just like walked in off the street and I would not uh, hit the mic again. And I would not necessarily recommend that as like your basic teaching structure in your first novice class if you're an instructor. Like that's not what I'm saying to do. But I am just saying at a higher level, if we're actually going to express this dance through movement, we need to be making active choices. And if we're making active choices, we need to have reasons for those active choices. And that's how we loop on back to all the training stuff that I was talking about in the beginning. Um, so Benji is a great example of this because if you're ever in a workshop with Benji, you can choose to agree or disagree with his choices inside of the dance, that's fine. But if you ask him a question about why he moves his body in a given kind of way, he always has an answer. Like he always has a precise and thoughtful answer for why he did what he did. And I think that that is just such an important part of being a good instructor. So that was a little bit of like a, a long-winded point. Yeah, so there are a couple comments about this being about the difference between um, difference between competitions and social dancing. So... And I think that that's a great point. There are big differences between competitions and social dancing. Like I'm okay with playing something with a hustle rhythm for social, but I'm just not gonna play it for a contest at this point. There was a time when I would, but I've kind of come around on that. So yeah, and Eric is, is in here making a lot of great technical points about the application of triple rhythm to a given song. 
Um, for, so Victor made a point for me, people like Benji, Jordan, Kyle, Royston, Mario, no matter what kind of song is playing, they are always swing dancing. Yeah, so there's, um, here's another comment that might get me into trouble. Great, why not? Just keep on going. Uh, so a while back, there was a, um, a legal case, and I forget what the legal case was, and I forget what it was. There was a political case, something like that. And it was about um, pornography. And there was a ruling that was made, or there was a statement that was made during this case that was, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think that that's just such a great line because for one, it's like everything that's deeply wrong with legalese and all of that mess. Like it would be nice if we had a really specific definition for everything that exists or for every legal case, for every dance or whatever it is. But West Coast Swing is like the ultimate version of I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it, right? Like we have we have a real lack of codification about many of the major concepts of this dance. And I would love, for the record, this is just one guy's opinion. I've only been doing this dance for about, in a serious way, for like six years. Um, and I do not pretend to know everything. And I would love to hear voices from people who have been doing this dance for longer than me and who have more experience on it than me on this given topic. But for me, it really is a perfect example of that sort of thing. Because um, it is true that when I watch Kyle dance, I know I'm watching swing dancing. Like he could be out there dancing to Havana or he could be dancing to Alva's. It just doesn't matter. That dude is swing dancing. Same thing with Robert and Benji and Mario and a lot of those guys. Like they know how to express their body to that underlying rhythmic structure of the dance, whether or not it's present in the music. And they take the music as a great source of information. Like the music's your friend in this dance. I think that's kind of an, may, I don't know, this may or may not be like an interesting concept, but I think that there's a way that we view the music as kind of the enemy sometimes in this dance. Like, the song has a hustle rhythm in it, so it's preventing me from doing West Coast Swing. Like, is it? I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it is on, like, some deep level, but I feel like you can basically express your movement in motion to a song, sort of regardless of the underlying structure of that song. Um, I think you should draw inspiration from the music. Like, the music is supposed to be the, your friend. It's supposed to be a source of inspiration to you. Um, it's supposed to give you cool stuff to work with. But again, I think that sometimes we take kind of like a very combative attitude towards it. Yeah, hopefully it's your friend, unless Victor's DJing and he chooses to mess with the all-star division as he commonly does, particularly for all skates. All right. No one, okay, so the next time you see Victor DJ a, cont uh, a contest, particularly if it's an all-star contest, just like walk into the all skates with an open mind and listen to them from the perspective of like, this is a little tiny bit of an IQ test, okay? And you'll have a great time because it really is. Like no one has played more 60 beat per minute songs for All Stars than Victor, I think, in the history of West Coast Swing. Okay. Um, yeah, Melissa was talking about suede in the bottom of her shoes, uh, of her, her vans for dance and play. Um, yeah, I actually remember seeing that and that actually was a really cool look. Um, and I personally, as a judge, didn't have any issue with, with the movement that was created by that. So it's not a bad idea. Um, Andrew was talking about intention and movement. Yeah, yeah, okay. So about movement and expression, say novice, because my personal experience was in having to eliminate a lot of that movement because the character of it was too uncontrolled and extraneous and it was preventing the expression of the underlying dance. That's a great point. Um, so there are kind of levels to this thing, right? There are elements of this that there are ways in which expression of the body can get in the way of expression of your swing dancing. That is absolutely 100% true. Um, and most of what I do when I first start working with somebody, if I, if I am teaching, and this was more in ballroom, which I used to teach more frequently, I don't really consider myself like a West Coast swing instructor because it's not what I do professionally. And I think that people should in general work with a professional. Um, but anyways, if I am working with somebody, most of what I do for starters is I get them to strip away movement which is kind of ironic given what I'm saying here. But what you are trying to do is get rid of all of the unnecessary stuff so you can build up kind of a strong core, a strong framework from the inside. Um, but that, just the fact that you're stripping away extraneous movement, like for instance, like if I'm dancing and I'm doing my sugar push and like all of this is just like going bananas while it's happening, it gets in the way of me being able to lead because it interferes with my partner and messes with my timing. It throws me off balance, all of that good stuff. 
But all of this going crazy is not the same thing as moving this body through space, you know, and actually taking a strong movement onto your one or allowing a follow through with your body countering the action of your arms or something like that. Like this still has to dance, even as we strip away some of the extraneous movement. And the balance between those two points is admittedly a difficult one to find. Um, okay. Seeing any of the comments. Yeah, I mean, Kyle for a while was seen as somebody who was pushing the dance in like a non-traditional way as, as Joel is talking about. And now he's viewed as like the old guard, right? It's, it's interesting how that happens. I mean, there was a minute where Mario, Mario was um, kind of viewed as someone who's really taking the dance in a new and different direction. And I mean, now I think that most people would consider Mario as like the ultimate holdout um, of kind of the, the more traditional uh, swing mentality. So, uh, yeah, Joel is waiting for him to play The Sky is Crying, which I think has actually happened. I forget if it was Victor or not, but I have definitely danced to The Sky is Crying in an all-star all-skate. And whoever that DJ was, oh, man. Oh, man, you are the worst. You are the worst. <laughs> okay, apparently there's some enjoyment of me just randomly flailing around in front of a camera. So, hey, we'll see what happens, guys. I think that we've kind of moved through most of the um, comments and I wanted to keep this sort of tight. And of course it turned into a 40 minute episode because I just can't help myself. Um, so anyways, uh, the ep this is sort of a non-traditional version of West Coast Live today because Andrew uh, had some internet connection problems. Thought I would just jump on in and do kind of an impromptu Q and A sort of thing. Um, if you haven't already, if you could answer the um, the question on our page about what time you would prefer us to move to, if you would prefer us to do a three p.m. time or a six p.m. time, and also if you have a preference for Tuesday or Wednesday, let us know. Um, until then, I think that this is the only episode that we're going to get in this week because Andrew is just straight booked for the next couple of days, and uh, so we'll see you guys again next week. I've sort of had a fun time doing this, so it was kind of entertaining. And uh, thank you for the questions. And hopefully I didn't uh, offend the, the soul of West Coast Swing with some of my answers on it. So until next week, guys, uh, thanks for joining. Oh, Joel's asking for a fashion tip of the week. Okay, this is not going to be a recurring segment. My fashion tip for this week is going to be suede your toms. All right, so this is the Melissa Smith uh, fashion tip of the week uh, brought to you by toms. Suede your toms. You know, just do something to get your butt in movement. All right. Thank you all for, for tuning in and uh, listening to this episode of West Coast Live. Talk to you soon.